Morning, everybody. Welcome to um, the session from the Southwest Cyber Resilience Centre, Staying Safe in a Digital World. It's great to see you here and welcome everybody. Uh, my name's Mark Moore. We'll do um, some more intros in a moment. I'm just going to wait here in the role of usher while people wander into the room. Morning to you, Brenda, who is the first person to have spotted the chat. Everybody do do say hello in the chat. Um, do share details. If anybody's wearing long trousers this morning, we think you're slightly mad, but we're very impressed nonetheless. Um, so do let us know where you're dialing in from um, and say hello to everybody else. Any comments or questions that you have during the course of the event, please do drop into that chat. Uh, and um, and it's lovely to see here, see you here this morning. I'm going to pass over in just a second to Mark Shelford. Mark is the uh, Police and Crime Commissioner for the Avon and Somerset Force and actually leads nationally in terms of fraud and cyber. So, um, Mark, it's great to have you along this morning. Um, if, if I can, um, I can see that we've got something like 33 people now in the room. So, folks, only thing I will say, this session, clearly you are not camera on and communication is via chat, so please do use it. We do, however, record the session so it can be made available to you and to others afterwards. So we hope that's OK. Lovely to see you. And without further ado, Mark, I will pass the virtual microphone over to you. Mark, thank you very much indeed. And uh, welcome everybody to today's um, session. It's going to be incredibly useful for all of us, I think. You, you always learn uh, at these events, uh, and it's great hearing of other people's experience and knowledge uh, to build up your own. Um, to start with, I just want to touch on the role of the Police and Crime Commissioner uh, before explaining a little bit more about my national uh, portfolio and the importance of working together to tackle fraud, including cybercrime, and particularly prevention. Prevention in this, in this area is so much more important than tidying up after an event. Uh, and that's what we have to help build our SMEs and the public and make them much more resilient and resistant to this type of crime. So what does a police and crime commissioner do? By law, I have to do a number of things. For example, I have to produce a police and crime plan which sets out the strategic direction of the police service uh, and the office of the Police and Crime Commissioner. Now that was built around my manifesto and it was certainly uh, endorsed by the public, um, not least because I was a candidate for two and a quarter years. So I was knocking on an awful lot of doors or virtually uh, feigning people when I couldn't go out and uh, visit them because of COVID. Under my plan, which has recently been published on our website, and please do go and read it if you get the chance, there are four priorities for Avon and Somerset Police. The first is preventing and fighting crime. The second is engaging, supporting and working with communities, victims and partner organisations. The third is leading the police to be more efficient and effective. And then finally, increasing the legitimacy of and public confidence in the police and the criminal justice system. That's the whole spectrum of the criminal justice system. And I am the chair of the local criminal justice uh, board. So it takes it from the first time you might meet a police officer all the way through uh, to probation uh, and then settling back into the community. And of course, prevention again is really important in that aspect. I want the police uh, to be reassuring communities by building a culture that puts the emphasis of policing back into prevention of crime. This means the police need to strengthen partnership working, have greater visibilities in their communities, including uh, in the cyber community, better engagement with communities, a focus on early intervention, reducing reoffending, oh, And we all know, well, maybe, maybe people don't know, but, um, and I certainly didn't know until I became involved in this uh, world, that of the people that go to prison, 80% of them have been in prison before. So if you can focus on that group of people who you know well, because they've got a track record, you know where they live, etc., and you can stop them reoffending, you can reduce crime significantly. And that is an area which I'm spending quite a lot of time focusing on. 
And finally, to improve the outcomes and support to victims um, and witnesses of crime. The creation of the Police and Crime Plan is an example of engaging the local people uh, in itself, not least because it came from the manifesto knocking on doors, but also continuing to uh, listen to the community, both by myself, um, by my office and the police officers of Avon and Somerset. And it's about improving the service we deliver and strengthen public confidence uh, in trust. I was rung, oh sorry, I was, I was uh, emailed this morning about an incident last night in Bath where a person had wanted to try and phone the police in order to prevent a crime happening, put onto 101 and didn't get a proper connection. And after half an hour got bored and stopped. And this is an absolute failure. We, we need to focus on this and make sure that we do get involved uh, in these things early and we have the right numbers and the right place to do that. I believe that Avon and Somerset Police can deliver real change and improvements under the priorities that I've set. Um, but the most important thing is to listen and engage with those local people to understand what their problems are. And this comes full circle to uh, cyber crime, because the reason I took up this national portfolio was that when I was knocking on the doorstep or ringing people, I was stunned and amazed by how many people had been affected by this type of crime uh, on the doorstep. And um, I thought, goodness me, I, we really need to do something about it. Um, just continuing a little bit more about um, the priorities. You know that I want to ensure that the police are as efficient and as effective as they can be within the community. And the golden thread that runs through that is about prevention. And I asked right at the beginning, um, when I had a, an experience of going on a ride along uh, with, a, with a very successful uh, uh, drug operation where we, we, we got the head of a particular organization. Um, but the process of booking in, booking out, going to court, booking in, booking out, etc., absorbed an enormous amount of time. There were endless paper forms that needed to be filled in with lots of the same material. So when I arrived, I asked, uh, could the chief uh, constable and the team look at how to make that more effective, uh, particularly make it digital uh, and make sure it's protected, but also that that digital platform could link to the MAJ of the court system. And that in itself about sharing data and all the issues around GDPR uh, was a uh, an issue, but we got there in the end. And the final aspect of the PCC's role is to contribute to um, the Home Secretary's requirements for national and international uh, policing. This is interesting, of course, because quite a lot of digital crime takes place, about 70% or 75% takes place with an international evidence, uh, piece to it. And so we need that international uh, liaison uh, and those agencies that can work abroad in order to be to chase down the criminals and make sure that they understand that the UK is a hostile place to taking any type of digital crime. So as a consequence of my time as a candidate, uh, I volunteered uh, to take responsibility for the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners for Economic and Cyber Crime. I want the work of the APCC uh, to ensure that the police tackle online crime, fraud, harassment, hacking, economic crime, and identity theft. Uh, because we hear about identity theft a lot in, the, in um, newspapers and, and perhaps uh, on television, but actually the reality is it does happen and it happens far too often. One in 10 people fall victim to fraud and one in three become repeat victims. And that is appalling. We really need to, to focus on, on that, preventing uh, people becoming repeat victims. I want to uh, make sure that the profile type of, of this life-destroying crime is raised. I want government to know this and really understand, and also from a policing perspective, make sure that we put the right amount of resources uh, into fighting this type of crime and preventing it. Um, if 
what you believe is true that is published in the newspapers that more than 50 percent of all types of crime at the moment are some form of cyber and fraud connected and online um, digital sexual exploitation we're not putting nearly that amount of resource into preventing it and fighting it and we need to uh, wake up and smell the coffee and that takes certain issues around making sure that we've got the right people who are knowledgeable, trained and capable in those jobs. And so to be part of the Southwest Cyber Resilience Forum is fantastic and a really important part. And I'll come on to that in a little bit more. We really need to raise the awareness about these different types of frauds and techniques within the population and to raise their ability to be more resilient and resistant to this type of crime. And as part of that, I produced a postcard that has gone out to all the grown ups over 65 um, with some simple steps about how to keep safe, uh, both online, but also um, on the telephone uh, and uh, on the doorstep. Very simple, work through with a lot of other people uh, but this postcard, which can be stuck next to their landline phone, because most of them will still have a landline phone, uh, just gives them that calming influence of having a read and not to be flustered by whoever's on the phone or on the computer trying to get them to make an instant decision to move money. Um, uh, raising awareness also in government, and I'm meeting the security minister tomorrow night uh, to talk through some of these simple aspects that we need to work through. Uh, in general across the country. So let's focus on the Southwest Re um, Resilience Centre. Those of you here today understand the importance of the cyber threat uh, to the business community and particularly to SMEs. I was an SME before I became a politician. I ran my own company uh, and I worked with a number of small companies who have been affected by cyber threat. And I know how awful it is and it's really important uh, that we put some focus into it around that SME piece. Government figures show that <clears throat> two in five businesses um, have had an attempted a cyber breach every year, which is why policing is investing in new approaches to try and reach out and help prevent businesses uh, and individuals falling victim. Hence, the great work uh, formed by the Southwest uh, Cyber Resilience Centre. It is a public-private partnership recognising the need to support the expertise of the business community in order to make inroads and to protect those SMEs. To that end, thanks to the Southwest uh, Business Council and Business West for getting behind today's event with their own support, marketing uh, and guidance regarding the contents of today. Both groups regularly participate <clears throat> in the Cyber Resilience Centre advisory group, and we are grateful for their support. And I know that the Southwest Business Council CEO, Paul Coles, who is on this um, call, will join us shortly uh, and say a few words. Today's events are centred around a top level expertise from the cyber sector and we're grateful to all those speakers giving up their time uh, to speak, but also for the people who put it together, uh, Mark and Leslie and everybody else who came together to make this work. They will be sharing some of the genuinely eye-opening stories about how your data has been taken and misused by criminals. However, today is not just about uh, interesting stories, it's also about what you can do practically to protect yourself and your business. Today's events will conclude with a short briefing about Southwest Cyber Resilience Centre and how you can support it. I strongly encourage you to take advantage of the support that they can offer you and tell your colleagues and others in business uh, to do the same. The more of us that are protected, the safer place the Southwest will be to do business. And I want to make sure it is a hostile place uh, for criminals to work in this space. So to close, I hope you find this morning's session uh, useful. If you have any questions, 
uh, for myself about being the PCC about my national portfolio, please do not hesitate to get in touch. Uh, and many thanks for you listening uh, today. And I'm happy just to take a couple of questions before I sadly have to depart uh, for another meeting. Thank you, Mark. It looks like I'm scanning the chat and it looks as though we're question free and brilliantly and left everybody in the state of total comprehension, in which case just a thank you from us for opening today. And uh, if I may, I can invite uh, if I can invite Kyle Bowes onto the stage. Um, and Kyle, I believe you're going to open with our first cyber presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Can you just jump back on stage and just let me know that you can he hear and see me before I speak for 20 minutes to myself? Oh, you are loud and clear. Perfect. Okay, well, for those um, joining us, I think I'm probably going to be the most northern today. I've seen a lot of Torquay and Exeter. Uh, I'm up in, I would say, Overcast, Edinburgh, uh, and I'm reliably informed in 27 minutes it's going to start to rain. So. Hope you all enjoy your heat wave while we are in the humidity, but we'll um, we'll see how that goes. Um, anyway, um, today I'm going to be covering a presentation on exploring open source information, and um, we're going to have a kind of a run through um, of what it is, how it can be used to exploit SMEs, um, and we have a little mini agenda. There'll be time for questions throughout today's session. Uh, please just use the chat function, um, and I've got a little Q and A slot. Um, after the slides to answer those, um, I am hanging about for the rest of the session, so if something pops into your head later on, just let me know. On my final slide, there is also contact details uh, via email or LinkedIn. So if you have a question that you're not wanting to ask in public uh, or in front of others, uh, please just connect to me on either that platform or send me an email uh, and we can go from there. So before we dive into it, just a little overview of kind of me and my background, uh, as well as Hyper9 and what we do here. And um, so back in kind of the early to mid 2000s, um, two people called Colin McLean and Dr. Natalie Kuhl thought there might be a cyber skills gap in about a decade so they were really thinking ahead of the curve and they decided to create a program called ethical hacking uh, which is a bachelor of science degree up at a small university in scotland and this was back in 2006 and the program's been running for about a decade and a half now um, i attended the program and qualified with a bsc in ethical hacking and uh, before moving to work in government throughout my studies um, i worked on behalf of UK Gov, uh, and then upon graduation worked there in a permanent role um, that role was predominantly offensive cybersecurity operations um, or computer hacking to the normal person. Um, and that is, job is just as fun as it sounds. Uh, brilliant experience working with some of the smartest people in the world uh, on some really complex problems. Um, so a really enjoyable kind of start to my career. Um, I currently manage a cyber defence programme uh, for the UK's largest pension uh, and insurance mutual. We run a multi-million pound cybersecurity programme here. Big team of engineers. Um, and lots of difficult problems to solve. Um, I also uh, co-founded and direct at Hyper9. Um, we are, I suppose, a little boutique cybersecurity company. And we were founded on the basis that working with lots of big cybersecurity companies, vendors and consultants, we found they were really expensive and they don't tend to understand business very well. So they might be great at coming in and saying, here is how we run a really secure business, but I tend not to think about the customers you have, the data you need to process, how you route to market, how you work with marketing teams and third parties. Uh, and they become very kind of theoretical and subject matter heavy, not thinking about the practicalities of the business. Some of our work has been things like working with the BBC and ITV behind the scenes on their cybercrime prevention programmes, making sure they're technically accurate, making sure the work delivered there is high quality and it's easy to digest by the public. Uh, to that end, if I use any technical jargon today that you're not quite sure what it means, just put it in the chat. That's not your fault. That's me for being daft and using technical terms. Um, it shouldn't happen, but if it does, feel free to ask in there. Um, alongside that, we work with footballers, high net worth individuals, normally to secure their communications for them and their families, especially if they're traveling abroad um, or if they have um, you know, multiple houses, we will make sure that their home networks are, are safe and secure too. For small and medium sized enterprises, uh, we have a primary focus on providing cybersecurity consultancy as a service or um, what we call CISO as a service. Uh, we've found that in the market, a lot of uh, small and medium sized enterprise companies might have one or two people in IT. 
maybe three or four if they're if they're on that medium size, but they don't have a dedicated security person. And normally, a senior person in IT doesn't have that security expertise. Now, unfortunately, for these small and medium-sized enterprise, security expertise is expensive and difficult to get a hold of um, at that scale. So, what we normally do is go to the business one or two days a month uh, and help them build their security program um, that is business focused. So, we, we get them to a level of assurance uh, and resilience without them bursting the bank and having a dedicated security person who they have to train and maintain and look after. Um, so, I suppose for SMEs, that's a big focus um, and that gap that we tend to fill for a lot of SMEs. We do this kind of up and down the country, so we're not just up in Scotland. Uh, and it tends to be good fun seeing you know, small charities go from this. We've got one or two people on IT, we're not really sure what to do, doing, upskilling those members in IT and building a security programme that they can confidently sit back to. Anyway, that's enough about me um, and what I do at Hyper9. Uh, we'll jump into the main uh, presentation just now. Um, so a high level agenda is what is open source, how attackers can use it, a case study uh, that we worked on, and then also a bit of a summary on how we target SMEs and what you should be doing to protect yourself from this type of attack. I'll then go into the Q&A. Like I said, please use the chat feature throughout um, if you do have any questions that pop up. So first of all, what is open source? Uh, open source is information that can be discovered publicly um, by anybody. Um, it seems relatively simple when it comes in multiple forms. Uh, an example of this might be a social media feed that you have, like a LinkedIn for Business page, um, or it could be the electoral roll if people have registered to be on the electoral roll. Websites also count, um, and we'll walk through how this can be used by attackers as well. So if we think about uh, the Southwest Cyber Resilience Centre, um, if we were going to try and break in here, what open source could we use? So if you jump on uh, the Southwest Cyber Resilience Centre's website, swcrc.co.uk, and click on About Us, you can see about their team, the directors, their board, the advisory group, all these sorts of things. So we can start to discover who works there. And they all have a little synopsis of their bio of what they're interested in, what they do for work, and lots of other companies' websites are like that. I'm not going to pick on another company, uh, but we're with the Southwest today, so, so let's use them as a really good example. So if you go onto your company website, have a think about what information is there about your employees and how could that be used. So looking at the dynamic of the Southwest, they have um, a core team and then an advisory group uh, and a board. So if we think of Mark as the director here, Mark will get access to a lot of information, company accounts, banking, um, his emails will be rich and full of information. Um, so let's say we want to go after Mark. Well, in open source, we can go on the website and learn about who Mark is and what he does, but then also who sits on the board, and we start to build that relationship. So if someone's sitting on the board, Mark's going to want to speak to them regularly, be in touch with them. So if he gets an email from the board asking them for something or to look at a document, Mark's likely going to reply. So when we start thinking about how we're going to craft an attack against the Southwest Cyber Zone Center, the website's a great place to start. We can learn about the people, who has power, who are we interested in, who's likely going to have you know, senior access, and use that as an information gatherer. It's not just about the website. We can have a look on their LinkedIn too. So let's have a look on Southwest Cyber Zone Center LinkedIn, and we can see there's a webinar running today. How would we get after some of their clients? So let's say we've got to compromise some SMEs. Let's have a look at who's either Mark's attending or is following the page, and let's send them out an email half an hour before the event saying, hey, we've changed uh, the webinar. To join the instructions, have a look at this PDF. We have a malicious PDF in this email, but it's very, very convincing. And this is how quite quickly we can become very convincing um, trying to target SMEs um, for relatively low effort. Um, if you think about your website as well, it's registered. So if you go to a website called who.is or who is, it will tell you who that website is registered to. Now, traditionally, probably 10 years ago, that would give people's personal names, email addresses, phone numbers, and home addresses. Um, we've got a bit better at that and there's no privacy protection in there, but it will show you um, the types of technologies they use. So, for example, if you gain, if you check who owns uh, the Southwest Cyber Zone Centre, you won't get a name, but it will point to uh, Microsoft Online. So you can take a pretty good guess that you're running something like Office 365 or Microsoft product for their emails, which is a good place to start. Um, just to point out that none of this is prior knowledge. I haven't sat down and spoke with Mark about the technologies they use or their website. I think this, these are just things that we can use to discover. And again, think about your own business, what is available out there online, discover about it. For organisations in the government supply chain, and I've seen um, some people in the chat were talking about being part of the supply chain for DWP and the government departments, FOIA becomes extremely powerful. So the Freedom of Information Act becomes very, very powerful um, if you're a computer hacker trying to break into an organisation. 
Um, I'll walk through a previous engagement we've done um, against a government department to, to emphasise how powerful this can be. Uh, we posed as salespeople, saying that we were trying to sell them IT equipment, so we wanted to know about the current IT equipment they have and how it's used. Now, rather than asking for that, we asked for far too much information. We asked for serial numbers, we asked for operating system versions, we asked for the people who use them, version numbers, full shit match, thinking that we're going to get a reply saying that information is not valid, but here's how many we have and here's how much they cost. Now, people under a lot of stress and a lot of pressure, especially people running FOIA offices, don't have time sometimes to do that. And we took advantage of this, where we had a FOIA response, which included the version numbers, serial numbers, operating system versions. And actually, very quickly, we got a deep understanding of the technology stack, what technologies that were used and where. And this allowed us to, to plan a way of breaking into this organisation using FOIA. Again, if you're part of um, government supply chain, um, commu those communications between you and government um, may be able to be FOIA'd. So think about the information you're sharing with your partner and how the Freedom of Information Act could be abused to get that information. A lot of people think about this, um, and we've used it in numerous security engagements in the past to, to successfully break into clients. The last example um, I'll give um, is kind of a two-pronged approach to this open source weaponization, uh, and it was against a, a chemical lab run by a university. And the university ran um, a stage two uh, biochemical lab, which is going to be super protected for the information it's holding and the you know physical chemicals it's processing. So we took a two-pronged approach. First of all, we fired the university um, and the supply chain for a delivery contract. Who del delivers to and from the site? Because again, we are salespeople. We're looking to, to bid on that. It's generally quite a good tactic to to get the information you need. So we had the name of the organisation um, they were paying for deliveries. And we also were given the schedule um, and the weight and size of the lorries it required. So it's quite a lot of detailed information about access to this biochemical lab. Um, and then we had a look on LinkedIn. We looked at all the staff who worked in the security team there and found that they all had a list of qualifications. These qualifications were all really similar and all dated in the last year or two, um, which were qualifications on an electronic locking system. So very quickly, we'd gone from having no idea about this chemical lab to who the suppliers were, what time they arrived and how they arrived, as well as the technical security controls they had in and the locking systems and electronic security they used based on their LinkedIn qualifications of their staff. <laughs> now, this sounds a bit extreme um, and you might be sitting there thinking, well, I'm just a, a small business, so how does that apply to me? Uh, and the premise that we're getting at is if you do have a couple of members of staff, just think about what you're posting on LinkedIn. Have a little social media policy to say, do these things and don't do these things. When you're engaging with suppliers, um, either up or down the supply chain, have a think about the information they're sharing and whether connecting on LinkedIn and posting about the great work you're doing together could bring in an element um, of additional risk from a cyber perspective. Attackers use open source really, really aggressively. The better you plan and the more you know about your target, the more likely you are to be successful. Think about anything. If you're going on a holiday and you plan it a year in advance and you have an itinerary and everything to take with you, it's going to be a lot easier to go and enjoy that holiday than it is if you rock up to the airport with three bags and say, right, we're going on a holiday today. And they say, oh, have you got your COVID passport? Oh, forgot that. Where's your passport in the house? Didn't, oh, forgot this, forgot that. So, you know, transition that into an like offensive cyber operation. What we really want to focus on is to prepare work um, in this stage. So just be cautious and mindful of, of what you've got online and what your staff are doing online too. Moving on to social media, and this isn't just at LinkedIn, it's also kind of about your personal lives and Facebook and Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, whatever social media platforms you're using. We suffer from this thing called the appending issue, and this has really became apparent in the last couple of years. When you think about a post on social media, it's made in isolation. Just off to get dinner or just checking in at the airport. Um, what else do you post on social media? That's not what I see on my feeds anyway. Uh, people on holiday, um, people out taking photographs of the dinner, whatever they're doing. Um, from a business perspective, we might talk about landing a new client or visiting a site or uh, a new facility you've got, something like that. And you post in isolation, so you post and post and post and you post, and all these little posts add up. Now, Facebook's been running for about 15 years, um, and most people have probably been active users for about a decade at this point. So the decade of Facebook status updates or tweets or Instagram posts potentially out there. Um, if you've got rubbish security settings and anyone in the world can see your Facebook or Twitter page, be aware of that. If I can look back over the last 10 years of all your status updates and what you've been doing, 
when my son was born. That's the first day at nursery, first day at primary school, first day at high school. I can see all that. I have a chronicle, logical order of what's been happening in your life for the last decade. And targeting you with a, a, a phishing email, a really targeted phishing email, becomes very easy. Clay, who's presenting after me, will come into a bit more about phishing, but this really this reconnaissance work against individuals is really important. Um, as an SME, normally your home life and personal life are quite closely linked, especially if you're just a small one-person or two-person business. And that personal information leverage to target your business can become really powerful. So all I'd say is be mindful about what you're posting on there. Um, and if you're going to do anything, have a little look for your security settings. Who can see all of your posts? Who can see who you're friends with? Who can see what you're doing day to day? It's really, really important. Um, but not just for you. Think about your parents or grandparents or kids or grandkids, any vulnerable people you've got in your life. Have a think about them. The problem with cybersecurity is that it's complex and there's not a lot of expertise. So people lose out on this type of information. So after today, have a sit down. When you're having dinner tonight, have a chat and say, or probably a barbecue actually, have a chat and say, have a look through your Facebook settings, have a look through your LinkedIn settings. You don't have to be super invasive, but it's always good to, to look after people around you, especially in something like cyber, where it is very complex and can get quite dangerous quite quickly. Briefly, I just want to cover a, a high profile case study in targeting um, what is a small and medium enterprise who we worked with. Um, so James and Mantha are not their real names, uh, but they are a couple we worked with. Now James owns a, a fairly successful kind of small to medium sized enterprise, leading towards medium size at this point. Uh, and Samantha's wife um, has a really popular Instagram account, um, focusing on like homeware, uh, posting about the house and fashion and all sorts. Um, they've been having clients for just over a year now, and their their biggest concern was when their house was robbed. And this is what we call a cyber enabled crime. Now, after kind of the last couple of years, they decided to go on holiday. Um, really excited to go, really nice holiday, probably nicer than any holiday I've ever been on. Uh, it looked brilliant. Um, got to the airport and checked in. Uh, Samantha was posting on Instagram in the lounge for a little cocktail. Landed at the villa, here's the pool, here's what we're doing. Uh, kind of daily updates on Instagram account um, for all, kind of all of our followers, a bit of an Instagram thing. So. Uh, James had his out of office on, um, posted a couple of photos online as well saying, here's what I'm doing. Um, he actually posted on his work account uh, just to some of his employees to say, here's what I'm doing on my break. It's important to take time away. I'm doing it as well. Set a bit of a role model for making sure people are taking breaks. Um, fast forward three weeks, um, they land back in the country, checking at the airport and get home and the house is empty. Everything has been stolen. Nice tellies, games consoles, a lot. And what had happened, is, or our assumption is, um, that an organised crime group had been looking at the social media accounts. Um, because Samantha has this home account, the internal, so the home were pretty easy to see, where the valuables were, how nice some of their stuff was, and they were robbed blind because of this, you know, live stream of their life on a public social media channel. Now, fortunately, they had home insurance, um, so they give the home insurance company a call and they say, yeah, we'll send someone out. Someone comes out and says, yep, there's there's nothing left in your house, we'll get your claim processed. And before they'd done that, they went and had a look at James and Samantha's social media accounts, which again were public. They found that they were out of the country for 20 days, and actually their home insurance covered them for 14 days contiguous absence from the UK. So it was unlimited number of days, but contiguously they could only be away for 14 days. This invalidated the house insurance, and they did not get the claim paid. So a really extreme example of where a cyber-enabled crime can cause you problems in the real world via like a burglary, which isn't just the physical loss of stuff, but you know the emotional damage it has. And also the confidence knock it had on Samantha and what she was doing at the time. So again, when you're traveling or you're traveling with your kids, just be super careful about how often you're posting about being away. Um, have you got cameras at home? Or do your neighbors know you're on holiday and just keeping an eye on your house for you? I think during the pandemic, some people have got a lot closer with the neighbors and some people have drifted. So, you know, if you do get on with your neighbors and I encourage everyone to go and speak to their neighbors, having say, can you just watch the house away for two weeks, here's your spare key just in case, could really be the difference between having your house burgled if you're posting a lot of social media and coming back to, you know, a normal house. Just lastly, I wanted to kind of summarise um, why attacking SMEs via open source is important. Um, it's very low effort, it's just jumping online and having a look, um, and it's high, high impact and high value. Um, it's impossible to detect if you're an SME or if even if you're a large organisation, it's impossible to detect people doing this type of work. 
uh, and the main protection is having a robust social media policy and um, having robust staff training and awareness uh, and being really confident in what information is out there. It isn't a problem having a social media account and sharing stuff. Uh, the problem comes when it gets out of control or you're not aware of what information is out there because this information can and will be used against you in a, in a targeted email most likely. People in you know high pressure and high stress jobs are more likely to fall for uh, phishing attacks uh, and untrained employees do pose that significant risk. So make sure you have that policy, have a chat with your employees, with your friends and your family, and just let them know to be, to be super careful in there. Um, that's all for me. Um, again, my email is here uh, on the screen. And if you'd like to connect on LinkedIn and have any questions, feel free to use that platform as well. Um, I'll pause now for some questions, which I think Mark has been thankfully looking at for me. So it would be um, good to hear any questions you've got. Carl, thank you for that. Um, I've been looking through and there are a couple that have dropped into chat that I think we've responded to during the presentation. Okay. So at the moment, I think we're good. What I'm going to suggest is if Clay joins us on stage, we can move on to his presentation. And then if there are questions that pop up, we'll try and deal with those in chat. At the tail end if we've got a couple of minutes to do that. But enormous thanks, Carl. Um, you had me feeling really nervous during several parts of that presentation. I'm going to go back and down my website now. Perfect. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Clay, over All to right. you. Morning, everybody. Uh, so we're going through the cost of phishing. So this is more on the, the, the after effects of kind of what Carl's spoken about today. So myself, I'm a security analyst with uh, Bit Security. We're a managed service provider where we provide uh, a MDR, which is Managed Detection Response Service. And we also provide Cyber, Cent uh, cyber Essentials Assisted and along with penetration testing. And then we've got my specialty within the business, which is security awareness training, but also delivering simulated phishing training. So that's uh, sending companies these phishing emails to try and boost the training that they get from that to see where the risk for. Just to make sure that we're all aware of what phishing is. So phishing are, is when you get those malicious emails. Uh, so it's an email pretended to be something legitimate but actually it's trying to entice you to click a link, download a file, or respond to some personal information for them to then breach you further on down the line. So I just want to open up with a with something that happened not, not too long ago, where on the 29th of April, so just a couple of months ago, uh, there was a school district which was manipulated into transferring nearly $200,000 to a cyber criminal's bank account. And this, this was carried out by a spear phishing attack. And what they did, they targeted the, the school district in an attempt to gain funds via a spoofed email, which was sent pretending to be uh, someone, it was pretended to be someone called Ben Hill Roofing. And this school district actually had work done recently and worked with this person. It was then discovered later on down the line when the actual Ben Hill Roofing submitted an invoice to the school. So it wasn't an immediate, it was, it was months down the line that they then figured out what actually happened. Thankfully though, they have been able to recover almost all of the funds. There are still some left uh, for them to try and get. It was after a police investigation was carried out on this on this event, and the funds were traced to a bank in Texas. So it was all, all American-based, all kept within the country. And then Floyd County Schools, they've, since, uh, they've then made a public quote as well, saying they'd since recovered almost all of the stolen funds following the police investigation. Apologies for the fire alarm. There we go. Following a police investigation, officers traced the stolen money to a bank in Texas, which had already been flagged. So the bank had already flagged this account as being suspicious after they gained uh, an enormous amount of funds without any of kind of a due course. So in 2021, Tessian Research, they found that employees receive an average of 40 malicious emails per year. For some industries are higher than this uh, with and hit particularly hard with retail workers receiving an average of 49 a year so that's over well, it's over two a month over four a month that they're receiving uh, these these phishing emails out of these emails that are sent one person clicks a link in 86 percent of organizations which then relates to phishing accounting to 90 percent of data breaches which is a massive amount of uh, percentage that someone in, in your organization is likely to click a phishing link. And then phishing attacks, they tend to, to follow a pattern where they rise by 52% in December. 
So this is due to the holiday season, causing people to relax and be more enticed to risking opportunities that appear too good to be true and therefore more likely fall victim to phishing emails. It has been determined that of these malicious attacks delivered, 96% arrived by emails. And in terms of phishing, spear phishing, so phishing is a generalized email that they can send to anyone to entice them. Spear phishing, where they've performed the, uh, the open source reconnaissance, so going through social media, websites, to craft an email dedicated to that one person. And you've got whaling, where you're hitting the bigger targets, so you're hitting the the CEOs and the directors who set a higher level within the company to try and get a bigger payout at the end of it. And then 3% are carried out through malicious websites. So that's where they, where you click a wrong URL, uh, a wrong, wrong link. Uh, when you're doing a search for a website, you miss a letter, you place it with a wrong one, anything like that is where those come into fall. And then 1% by phone, which includes uh, smishing, which is text message, based and then phishing which is when you receive that phone call from an unexpected number and they're the same your bank account's been been breached and you need to provide details over the phone to get that fixed there's another research by semantic research and they suggest that throughout 2020 one in every 4200 emails was a, was a phishing email that's most likely risen since those uh, with the covid phishing emails that were going out and now with Ukraine, they, they tend to take what's happening around the globe to graph these emails to be more dedicated to what's, what's happening and get more likely someone to click on those, li those links. So what types of information is compromised? So this comes in all forms of, when they're trying to compromise your information, it comes in all different forms. It could be a spoofed login page. So it'll make a, give you a pop-up page that looks like an office 365 login page or your Gmail account login or your Facebook. And then it requests the user to enter their information just as they would any other time when they're going onto that site. And all of this information can then be used to gain further compromise, both the compromise both the individual and the bank accounts that they have, social media accounts, and also the business through allowing them access to sensitive information and accounts or through other means. So the types of compromise you have, you have credential based, so that's your, your passwords being, being taken, your usernames and your PIN numbers as well. This then allows them access into your accounts, but also allows access into systems as well. You've got your personal data, so your name, that's quite common knowledge, but also your, your addresses, your email addresses, where you've been, what you've been doing, any other information they can pry. And they can then use this down the line as well to, to form another attack on either yourself or somebody else to then compromise even more information or gain access to other things. Then they can also ac get access to your medical information. So these were the top three, your, your treatment information, your insurance claims, try and build that big picture of what's going on uh, in your life. And then the consequences of this, 60% of organizations have lost data due to a social engineering based attack. 52% have all had organizations had their credentials or accounts compromised, which then leads to the loss of information and other, other things down the line. 47% of organizations were infected with ransomware. So that's where potentially they've had their, their important information in their systems encrypted and they've been demanded some form of ransom to get that information back or preventing it from being delivered elsewhere on this, uh, online. 29% of organizations were infected with malware. So that's, that's, your vir that's uh, various different types of software, malicious software that potentially cause damage within the network and on, the, on your IT systems. And then 18% of organizations experienced financial loss specifically due to this. So any of these such actions would cause a substantial damage to the organization, resulting into the loss of financial assets, reputation as well, and trust from the public or other companies, depending on the specifics of the information that was breached. So in 2021, Risk IQ estimated that businesses worldwide lose $1.7 million per minute due to cybercrime. 
and that the average breach costs a company $7.2 per minute. Obviously, once that breach takes longer and longer to resolve, 24, 48 hours a week, that, that number just gains and gains and gains. Then IBM's 2021 research into the cost of data breach ranks the cause of data breaches according to the level of cost they impose on businesses. So phishing ranks as the second most expensive cause of data breaches. The breach caused by efficient cost businesses average of 4.65 million, according to IBM, and business email compromise. A type of phishing whereby the attackers hijack or spoof a legitimate corporate email account ranks at number one, costing businesses an average of five, $5 million per breach. That's not the only way that phishing can lead to a costly breach. Attacks using compromised credentials were ranked as the fifth most costly cause of a data breach, averaging $4.3 million. And how do credentials get compromised? It's more often than not due to a phishing email that's, that's happened. Then this is all broke down. So in terms of when they make the cost, it's not just the financial, it's the loss of hours from employees. If they don't have access to the information, they can't do any work. And if they try and remediate then those remediations they're trying to put in place. There's more hours have been lost and more cost, which has happened. Then also got the instant response of trying to solve the issue that has now happened due to someone clicking a malicious email or downloading a malicious file. You've got the reputation damage as well. So you, you've got, so yeah, sorry. You have the damaged reputation. So if you've lost personal information for people or for other businesses, they're, they're gonna think again about, about working with you in the future. And then you've got lost intellectual property, which then falls onto the damaged reputation as well. You've got the direct monetary losses. So if you've been infected with ransomware, you've had to pay back. Or if someone's spoofed, got the funds out of you directly, this all takes effect. Then you've got the lost revenue and the legal fees on top of that as well. So all think about. So we've spoken a lot about the business and kind of how it affects the businesses uh, that, that you work for and you're part, part of. But here's a social media event that happened not too long ago where verified Twitter accounts were being fished by giving hate speech warnings. So what they did, they hijacked verified accounts on any platform as it's a big win for fraudsters. It gives credibility to their scams, especially when the accounts have large followings. This has been a particularly popular topic to promote NFTs and other crypto centric scams. As so what they'll do, they'll breach a, what would, would be a credible account with a, a mass following and then make a post of you donate to this, this fund, I'll give you this in return. But actually it's someone behind the scenes who have made that post and now got you to, to provide them money directly. And what they tend to use, the, the site, hides behind a URL, shortening service, and it claims visitors are logging into a Twitter help center, making use of Twitter's, Twitter's APIs to call up the reporter's test account name. It then asks for their password, it gives them a welcome back message, alongside an image of the reporter's profile picture, making it all seem a little bit more real. The phishing site then asks for an email address and appears to be checking behind the scenes to ensure you're entering the correct credentials. Uh, it doesn't spam the database, so it's hard to detect from the other side as well, as it gets that information directly from you before inputting it. Draw things to be aware of. It might look true, but there are many things hiding. There could be things hiding in the background to try and steal that information from you. Okay. Now, if we do have any questions at all, uh, we'll, we'll be able to go through those for you. Dave, thank you so much for that. There are a couple of questions in the chat line. I'm going to invite, if it's okay with you, just for you to take a scan through those and maybe put some responses in. People are asking what you do if you click on a phishing link email, um, what an NFT scan is, um, a scam is, and, and some other bits and pieces too. If you're happy, just so that we can get the presentations through, um, I'll pass over to Paul and we can pick up any conversation afterwards if we've not been able to deal with it in the yeah, chat. Yeah, that's sure. I'll jump out and I'll... I'll answer those for you. Brilliant. Thank no you. Clay. Thank you. Thanks, Clay. Thanks, Mark. Are you hearing me okay? 
Brilliant. Well, we're we're thrilled to be a partner with the Southwest Cyber Resilience Centre on this hugely important issue. We've you've understood today some of the uh, challenges that are out there around how we uh, police all of this stuff. Um, the actors in this space are getting increasingly clever, but you've made a huge investment here today by joining the call. Thank you for that. I would recommend a couple of things, really, for those of you that haven't engaged in uh, the Cyber Essentials program, please Google that and have a look through. I noticed that on our survey around 50 percent had, but Cyber Essentials is backed by world leading experts and is all about keeping you and your business safe. The second thing I would recommend is that if you haven't joined the Southwest Cyber Resilience Center, please do. It's a free resource, right? It's a free resource that the uh, police forces around the country have, uh, have set up and the Southwest Cyber Resilience Center is probably the leading one, if not neck and neck with, I think, only one other area. So we're quite competitive here at the Southwest Cyber Resilience Center. Please join the network. It's free of charge to join. And more than that, when you go and speak with your own personal and business networks, encourage them to join as well. We're on a journey to hit approximately 1,000 members, hopefully in the next few months, I'd like to think. But if I reflect on that across the Southwest, there are half a million SMEs in our territory. So we still have a long way to go. But you've taken an important first step here by being part of this morning. I encourage you to take further steps and, and speak and work with your own private and business networks to encourage them to join the momentum around making us the most secure region in the UK with the Southwest Cyber Resilience Centre leading the charge on that. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Paul. Really grateful and for the support. Um, OK, folks, so I'm going to talk you through very briefly the Southwest Cyber Resilience Centre, which you've heard a bit about today. And I just want to tell you what that is and what's in it for you. Um, the really important thing, as, as Paul rightly says, is that we provide a free basic service. There is no sales pitch angle to this. We do not exist to make money out of small businesses. Quite the reverse. We're here to make sure that small businesses keep their hands on their money and don't pass it over to cyber criminals. So we're here for you uh, and we would be delighted to try and support you in staying safer in a digital age. We're not here for individuals. We are here very much for that small business community, also for charities. So inevitably, by the law of averages, there'll be people on this call who, you know, do, do that school governor role that support local community groups. And those are very often extremely vulnerable because they don't have the resources, the time or the expertise to look after themselves. We are really happy to support and to try and help. So, so what does that support look like? The first thing that it looks like is that we will signpost you towards those really important things that you've probably never heard of. And why would you in a busy world? So all the kind of national guidance that you need about what does a good password look like? What the heck is this thing called multi-factor authentication that I've heard drift by on the wind? All these concepts will make sure that you've got the right national guidance and will contact you to give you support to implement it if you need it. Within the Southwest region, we will also then put you through a 12 week plan. So an email a week, which will be no more than a page long because we've all got busy lives and might take you 10 minutes to implement. But do you know what? If you spend that 10 minutes once a week over 12 weeks, you will be immensely safer than you are at the start of that cyber journey. So, do you know, I often equate it to kind of locking the door in your business premises. You do that without thinking about it, but you can't in today's world fail to engage with a bit of cyber hygiene and cyber safety so let us show you how because let's be candid none of us were taught this stuff in school really importantly also we'll we'll give you a regular update so i spend um, a fair old bit of time each month looking through what's gone in the cyber world and we'll make sure that's translated into plain jargon free english for you so that you know what i should click on what i shouldn't click on what i should update and what I should look out for. So you can use it and of course you can pass it on to your staff so that they've got that basic awareness and they don't leave you exposed. And do you know what? As I often say to people, we've got really in good, good engagement with that, but if you read one in five, then at least 20% of the time, then you're safer than you would have been. So do something rather than do nothing because it really is easy to get safer online. 
We've also got some really interesting offerings for you if um, you're a particularly data vulnerable business or if perhaps you're significantly web based. Um, we have a fabulous student team from around the region. They're drawn from ethical hackers and they can come in and look at your technical systems for you and they'll do that in a way that's very affordable so you won't pay full commercial rates. Um, so it's tailored as an offer so that we can check whether you're vulnerable let you know where you might need to sharpen things up and give you, if you like, the shopping list that you might need to go to a, a cyber company with so that you understand the areas where you're running a bit of a risk that perhaps you'd rather not. Um, more than that, the students can offer training and often we can find that through existing police resources for free. They can look at some of the stuff we've spoken about today, that open source information trawling, what can we find out about you that might compromise you or your business so that you're really aware of that? And we can look at your continuity plans as well so that if the worst were to happen, you've got that kind of plan on the shelf that you can take off and know exactly how to respond. So that's the student services. We don't sell products. There are a number of really complex offerings that we don't have. And that's where we'll pass you on then if you need them to a regional partner, somebody like Bit Group, Clay's, Clay's team that came on the call today. And the reason that we pass on to those companies is because um, they're operating locally to you. We've got a strong relationship with them. And actually, they all offer that cyber essentials scheme, which Paul mentioned earlier on the call. Cyber essentials is a government badge scheme that, that talks about the basics of cyber security for small businesses. So all of the companies that we'll pass you on to know the cyber security basics and we think that's really important because the landscape is fairly unregulated and if you need help probably what you don't want to do is give the keys to your digital vault to somebody whose accreditations you just don't understand or recognize so we'll try and signpost you in the right direction it's not because we'll get a kickback from that it's because it's the right thing to do so look what you can see in terms of that offer is that the whole purpose of it is to take take you from not to 60 from the start of your cyber journey and for those bigger companies through the accreditation route and through the other support that you might need so we are here very much for you we're here for those that work with you and i often raise that question the person that does your marketing does your printing how safe are they because if they're sending you dodgy emails because they've been compromised then that's a risk to you, isn't it? And last year, 90, 93% of larger businesses were compromised via their third party network. So that's really worth bearing in mind. This isn't just about you, it's about the people that do business with you as well. So if you haven't signed up, please do consider it. If you know people, please spread the word. And if you're a member of one of those community groups, and again, please do signpost us towards them. And what does that look like and what do you need to do? Go to our website as ever. Go to our website, find lots of stuff out about us, just as Kyle has done. But more than that, please go to the membership link. And when you get there, we'll, we'll simply ask you some details so that we can contact you via email, pass you the information that you need and keep you on our mailing list so that you've got the information that you need now and into the future. So that's the Cyber Resilience Centre for the Southwest. We are part of a national policing network. If you have other contacts out of area, please do feel free to get in touch and we'll signpost them to the right uh, centre for them too. That's not a problem. So I think that's probably it from us today. I'm just going to take a very brief scan through the chat and I think everything has just about been responded to there. So um, thank you, ladies and gents. Uh, two minutes early. Uh, it's been fabulous to see so many of you online. We really hope that you found something useful from today's uh, presentation. And I would just like to thank again our fabulous speakers who um, I I'm glad that we didn't have to pay for that level of expertise because it's not cheap in the cyber world. So to Clay and to Kyle particularly, thank you for your time. We're really grateful. We hope to see uh, many of you at uh, jumping into the inbox shortly as you register and please do spread the word but thank you again for joining us hope you found it valuable have a great day and uh, and stay cool thank you goodbye